everybody for Cryptocurrent. I'm Stephen Miller and you are watching the Aftershock, your weekly dose of what's going on in Web3. Of course, I'm always joined on these episodes by my friend and co-host Richard Carthon. Richard, how are you doing today? What's up everybody? Doing good um, as we get close to the end of this year. It's a wild week uh, ahead in a lot of different ways. Uh, SBF, uh, is, is supposed to be talking, but we're going to see uh, what happens. Um, we got CPI coming out for, from the Fed. It's a uh, it's big week of news uh, that could impact uh, how this year wraps up and set the tone for 2023. Uh, but I am excited um, as I am getting ready to take a, a little wedding trip. So um, some some fun towards the end of the week for me, but uh, in the world of crypto, man, it's it's... It's been a year. It has been a year. But how a about year, you? How are you doing? A year it has been indeed. Um, I'm doing okay. I'm a little bit um, overwhelmed by the amount of conversation that we've been having about AI in the community across the last couple of weeks. Um, but and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit here. But I think that all in all, it's the holidays. Things are going to slow down just a little bit. But all together... I'm optimistic. I think 2023 is going to be a really, really big year. We've got one final episode of the Aftershock before we go on a quick holiday hiatus. Um, so if you at home are just joining us for the very first time on the Aftershock, we do these shows every single Wednesday. But next week will be our um, penultimate episode for the year. Um, we've got a really great one planned for you. It's going to be our 2023 predictions and a quick review of what we had scoreboard-wise for 2022 and our predictions that we had um, just at the end of last year. So it's going to be an exciting episode next week, a little bit different of a format, but I'm pretty pumped about it. I think it's going to be a good time. Um, But today we've got our standard episode of the Aftershock for you, but with all brand new news, just the way we do every week. So if you're new here, please make sure you subscribe. We'd love to see you back next week for our predictions episode. And we're going to get things started with this week's Aftershock. Let's dive in. The Aftershock. So at the top of the Web3 lightning round this week, we've got a quick question. And I told you it was coming. Will chat GBT, GPT be the kill switch? Oh, I'm sorry. Will it kill search and open up a new path for um, a new path to Web3? Talking and reading are very hard for me this week. I do apologize. I'm going to blame it on my post-COVID brain. Um, but the question is, will chat GPT kill search and open a new path to Web3? Richard, what is your take on this? Because AI and open AI and what they've done with chat GPT is just unbelievable. Uh, I'm curious what you think this is going to do for all of Web3. Dude, this is going to change the world. Uh, I feel like people who like saw the very first search engine, like the very first time someone went on Google asked a question and answers and references came back in a a matter of seconds. I feel like this is that new level of amazingness because I don't know for those who are listening for the first time, if you have not uh, experienced chat GPT, uh, go ahead and and, and do it. It's it's extremely mind-blowing. You can ask any question and it will give you an answer. Uh, for example, if you, uh, I did the example for, for Steven that you could ask for a topic like how to set up a crypto wallet and it will s- create an entire blog post for you in under a minute. And it's very legible. doesn't sound like a robot wrote it. Um, and it's, it's remarkable. You could, you could ask them, uh, you could put in a calculus problem and it will walk you through how to solve that problem and give you the correct answer. It's, it is absolutely mind blowing to me that this technology exists in 2022. It, it scares me to think where technology will be in the next eight years, the next decade, when we hit the 2030, there's like how much more advanced this stuff will be. So I think this is going to open up the path, not just to web three, but 
to all things the future? Like, what's what's your take on this? I mean, it's really interesting, right? Like, we've always been taught since um, the days when, like, Terminator documented, you know, what, you know, robots and AI can do. And, you know, th- there's just so many ways it can go wrong. Um, it's fascinating the way that we've been conditioned to believe it's just going to be evil. It's going to be bad. It's going to be the downfall of society, Right. I think that what you're seeing right now is very much so not that. I think that what you're seeing right now is open AI showing what it can do to streamline a lot of the medial work that people go into on a daily basis. Now, how can we teach AI to sound more human? That's of course going to be a question. But beyond that, I bring up the question of with platforms like chat GBT, GPT. I keep going back to GBTC and that's just where my head's at for some weird reason today. But with chat GPT, it starts to beckon the question like, can the, can and should these AIs have individual independent signatures, right? That says this was generated by an AI. And that's a requirement that you have to show to be able to prove it, its authenticity and that it's, you know, computer generated as opposed to something that is human authored, right? I like, I want to believe in it. I want to see this stuff be used for good. But without that, like you start to go down this pathway of like, okay, how are we going to authenticate? How are we going to prove that this was done by a person or that as opposed to like, if you were in high school and you told Chad GPT to go write your, you know, closing semester paper, right? That type of behavior is ultimately going to be um, unproductive for society. Let's just call it that. But I think that right now, the way that it bridges to Web3 is by starting to incorporate smart contracts and blockchain in a way that can further validate the authenticity of whether or not something was AI generated or human generated and starting to create signature systems that track that work. Because ultimately, if, if a platform like this is generating a script or it's generating an essay, it's generating a blog post, there's going to be somebody else out there that asks a very similar thing. And across the internet, you're going to start to see a lot of plagiarism of, of different people that are claiming this is human generated, but in reality, it's just an AI saying the same thing over and over and over again to a bunch of lazy authors. So I think you need these authentication mechanisms, these honestly immutable ledgers, right? They can tell you this is definitively something that an AI wrote versus this is something that Richard Carthon wrote when he was trying to explain what X, Y, and Z means for crypto. So it's not, a, it's not so much a quick question, right? This is a really big deal. It's a huge, huge question with massive implications. But I think that's the way that it creates a path to Web3 for a lot more um, technologists. But let's go ahead and dive into the rest of the Web3 lightning round this week. And this is a story that should be near and dear to your heart already because we continue to talk about SPF here week after week. Richard, why don't you take this one for us? So the block CEO resigns. Uh, he failed to disclose SBF loans. So he got several loans directly from um, SBF at FTX and he used the money. Uh, one, some of the money was spent on a residence in the Bahamas, shocker, and also was using some personal loans to float uh, the block just so they could survive during these these bearish times and and keep, keep the lights on. Um, the way that this got released uh, was to the public uh, through the blog. Actually, made a, a blog post, shared it on Twitter, and it was just sad. It was for 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 a lot of the other execs in the room, they were utterly taken aback because they had no idea. And it this continues to go on to the idea of how how are background checks really being done on the top of the food chain at certain companies? And can you potentially try to get in front of some of this malicious activity? And in some ways I think you can for something like this. I'm not sure you really could. 
And I think this is just a tragic uh, for the company, for for the block, um, for, for this to happen. But goes to show that when the bulls are out and everything's good, people don't ask a lot of questions. And unfortunately, when people get max greed, they get very greedy. And when things go south and when things get bearish, the it comes back, it comes back full circle. I mean, look, this is just another example of how the proof of reserves argument is going to continue to come up. People are going to want more transparency into these businesses in terms of how their accounting looks. And it's going to require higher standards. And I think that's what we're going to get over time. Um, but it goes to show that like, it shouldn't just extend to exchanges, right? It should never just extend to the ex- exclusivity of exchanges. If you were a crypto company and you were taking on outside capital, there should constantly be a proof of reserves, a proof of capital, right? Because at the end of the day, like the block is going to continue on, but there's a real chance that they're going to be in some degree of financial trouble because of this. So it's going to start to change industry st- industry standards. Um, it's an interesting story, but I would love to go ahead into this next one. It's a very simple story. Coinbase, you may be familiar with them. They're urging their users to switch to USDC from USDT. Now, this comes right on the heels of there being some like big difficulties with USDT and the way that um, it has been managed and it has been um, tracked in terms of its reserves. It's not new, right? This news is not new at all. What is new is the fact that Coinbase is being very on the nose about the fact that they don't trust it. And that is going to be very damaging because Coinbase is the only publicly traded exchange that is out there, right? Tell me your take on this because like that's the way that I see it. I think this is really going to be the watershed moment for USDC breaking away from Tether. Yeah, I think this could be that moment, but I also think it's interesting... Because if if all of the users are switching from USDC to USDT, then that means the USDT is still going to be on Coinbase's book. So they're going to be left holding all this USDT. And so maybe they're hinting at the idea that they're no longer going to support USDT in the future. And so that these customers eventually might have to on off-ramp USDT elsewhere or have to go to some decks to get USDC to then go to Coinbase to, to, to off-ramp. So I think that they are subliminally, but also being very upfront that they are probably going to be trying to get USDT off of their books, um, especially as the whole proof of reserves and all of that continue, conversation continues to come out, um, especially because they are regulated the heaviest of all the crypto exchanges out there. And they know that if they have to try to prove reserves for USDT, they can't do it. But it, at least with USDC, with Circle and all that, they, they have a clearer path to accomplishing something like it. So that's my take on it. Yeah, look, I think that the the long and short of this story is that Coinbase is actually trying to protect their customer base right now. And that's something that no exchange really has been vocal about. <laughs> and I know how silly that may sound to somebody who's just like on the outside or that's just like trying to learn about crypto. But up until this point, we've continued to see exchanges not care about their consumers. Their consumers are their liquidity. That's all they are to them. Coinbase has been showing time and time again, and I, I don't think a lot of people would agree with this, but from my viewpoint, as somebody who understands business strategy, they're trying to really make a concerned effort in showing their consumer that they care about them and that it's like they want to extend protections, Right. Kraken, Gemini, uh, KuCoin, Binance, as far as I know, none of them had built-in education protocols. Correct? Yeah, Coinbase was literally putting in uh, Coinbase Earn, or not Coinbase Earn, uh, Educate, where you could like go and like take these courses, and by taking the courses, you get like a a piece of the different uh, cryptos that are out there. Uh, I don't know that any other platform had that. Yeah, they they straight away pioneered learn to earn. 
And I remember when it was called Coinbase Learn. They want the consumers to understand. They want the consumers to be educated. They don't just want to continue to perpetuate degen behavior. Um, by telling them to get out of USDT, they're just very simply encouraging their customer base to cover their bases, right? That's what they're trying to do. And yes, I am trying to keep it family friendly. Let's move on to this next story before I get too off, off base and jump into what I think is probably the most fascinating story of the entire week. And that is that just this past week at the Ledger Open event in Paris, um, Ledger has officially announced Ledger Stacks which is a full screen device made in partnership with a gentleman by the name of Tony Fidel. And he was the designer behind the iPod, one of the core collaborators on the iPhone and the designer behind the Nest thermostat, all of which have been revolutionary technologies um, across the last two decades, to say the least. The reason that this is particularly interesting to me on a couple different levels starts with him. Tony Fidel as a designer has been running a consultancy for the better part of the last decade since he really stepped away from Apple. And he is hyper selective about the products that he works on engineering with and he helps to design. He has said in an interview since, he only partners with companies and works with companies that he believes have a truly revolutionary idea and brings brings product to market that can truly revolutionize the way that the market needs, right? So what I see here is them rolling out finally a new full screen ledger device that is going to be way more user intuitive. It's going to be way more user friendly. And ultimately it is way more comfortable and almost reminiscent of the credit cards that you have in your wallet. Because it really is the size of like a credit card. And it's like, I think the thickness of like four or five, if you were to stack them together. So this is a really interesting development. It's a vote of confidence in terms of, you know, hardware wallets. And beyond that, I think that it adds a complete new layer of like ease of use into cold storage that we didn't have before. Everything before has been really clunky. So Richard, I'm curious what your take is on this because we do need to take this apart a little bit and help people understand the implications of it, who this device may be for, and if we think it's ultimately worth it to have one of these on hand. So give me give me your perspective on that first. You've heard us talk about security um, over and over and over on this show. And one of the most secure things that you can do is to put your crypto in a cold storage and Ledger has been one that we've called out uh, a lot. Um, full disclosure, I personally have a, a Nano, Nano S, um, and it's it's been great. I've had no problems with it. When I first got it, it was challenging. It was not like a super easy to understand user interface, but I was able to figure it out. For your everyday person, it, it, it might not feel the easiest to use. Something like this is very intuitive very easy. You just from having any type of smartphone device will be able to pick this up and have a pretty good understanding of how to make it work. Um, Now, at the same time, the price point is where I get hung up. They were not uh, shy about what they're trying to uh, sell this for. It's, I think it's uh, retail like 279 US. So after taxes, it's looking at something over 300 bucks, probably. And if $300 safely puts away all of your money so you have the ease of mind of sleeping at night, obviously that's a good investment. But for the first cold storage device that you would probably come out the gates and get, it's a little tougher. It's a little tougher. So at its current price point, I think it's going to be tough for your everyday retail consumer, especially for someone who's been looking to get into cold storage. But if if that doesn't price point doesn't shy you away. This probably is a really solid first place to, to begin your cold storage journey. How do you look at it? I think the the way they went about designing this thing is it's going to get adoption. And I think the the other piece of this that man, I would just be I would be pretty close to stunned if we don't see is them start to inter, integrate 
credit cards and like NFC payment into something like this. Because the way they engineered it, they engineered it really, really carefully so that they could basically say, this is meant to be the replacement for your wallet. You should not need a wallet if you have ledger stacks. So that on its own is really, really important to understand here. I'm going to get to the price in a minute. But to me, like you see all of these things about like, make sure that you know what you're signing before you sign it in terms of transactions. That's part of the big appeal of having a ledger in the first place for your security. You need to be able to go through the process of basically seeing what it is you're signing for, what you're granting access to, and where that payment is going to. With this, it's starting to provide you a touchscreen opportunity to read, understand, and sign transactions with absolute ease. It's clear, sign, in comfort. Um, it gives you a lot more productivity. It gives you a lot of ability for like securing your assets, making sure that like the experience itself is smooth. And you can go beyond that, right? With your current ledger, there is no personalization to it. With this, you actually have the ability to set a lock screen for it that is one of the NFTs that you own in your portfolio, or you can set it to a picture. It becomes a much more personal experience. So it's also got built-in wireless charging. Um, it has is Bluetooth equipped, so you can use it without cording to your phone or to your computer. It's a sleek build. Like to me, it's got it checks like all the boxes. But beyond that, if like in your home you're using multiple leg ledgers, it also has these like embedded magnets. So like when you stack them together, like they actually flip around as like one unit. So it's pretty interesting to me the way they've decided to roll this thing out. And you can very easily just import your seed phrase from your past ledger if you want to. So the thing is going to be, I think, well adopted. I think for the early or like the, the first time cold storage buyer, this is the perfect thing to enter with. Because if you're looking at the alternatives, the ledger uh, Nano X, not the S, the X, is the one that I think a lot of people really find themselves wanting to like get, right? It's the mid tier right now after they introduce this, but there's no, fu there's no touchscreen functionality. It's not easy to use or easy to understand right out the box. Um, this is completely easy to use. So for an extra hundred dollars on top of the current cost of a Ledger Nano X, this is a no brainer to me. For those of you that have a Ledger or you have a Trezor, I'm not sure it's necessary because you've already been conditioned to understand how to use it. You already know that if you're using MetaMask as your interface, that you need to be reading what the transaction is before you click sign. I Look, I think that this is a big moment. Okay, I think it's a big moment for cold storage wallets in general, crypto-based hardware, I think it's a coup. I think it really is. I think the Trezor is not going to be able to touch this in a year. Um, this is going to end up taking the reins as like the leading standard for crypto wallets and cold storage. So do I want it? Yeah, I do. I want to test it. I really want to test it. It's going to come available in March. You can pre-order it, I believe, starting on the 19th, um, unless you are a legit ledger market holder, which is the, the the official ledger NFT, in which case I believe you can start pre-ordering it on the 14th. Um, but it is, in my opinion, going to probably be one of the things that starts to make wallet solutions in crypto a lot easier to use. And that's what we need. We need wallets to get easier to use. So that's kind of my take on it. Um, are you, do you think that this is something that you would buy or no? Not immediately. I'd wait for other people to get it, get the reviews, make sure all the it, kinks are worked out and then do it. Because I'm definitely in the profile of like, I have something that works and I, I feel safe. So I, it, there's not a pressing need for me. I think the biggest difficulty for me on this one is looking at the price tag and being like, well, shit, I've already got stuff that does it. Yeah. And I, again, yeah. that's, that is exactly as you just said. What I think is cool is that you can use it standalone. It doesn't need to be plugged in, um, which your Nano and your Nano X, I believe, both have to be plugged in. 
So getting to use it freestanding away from your device, I think is a little bit more nice and convenient. Um, and beyond that, I do think the fact that this is using an e-ink display says a lot about the fact that they want this thing to be a like a staple, <laughs> right? They, they, they expect that you shouldn't have to charge this thing pretty regularly. Um, they say, I think they were saying that like on one charge, you should not need to charge this thing for a month. And if you think about your iPhone and you think about all the other tech that you like surround yourself with, there's nothing out there with that type of battery life. Like it's, it's incredible. Um, I do wish that they had a full color e-ink display. That would have made the price tag even more effective for me. I would have been like, yep, no brainer. But this is a grayscale screen. So you're going to have only that level of personalization to it. So for me, I want to buy it. Um, I just don't think that I want to shell out the cash for now. So that's our take on the new Ledger stacks. Let's keep forging ahead and chat about these final stories in the Web3 lightning round and then power through last week in the metaverse. Um, if you guys agree with us, by the way, on the Ledger stacks, like please let us know in the comments. We really do want to hear from you and get your take on it. Um, but let's talk about CZ. It should come as no surprise that CZ is like one of the most influential people across crypto. But Binance's CZ has officially topped Coindesk's uh, 2022 most influential list. It's a list of 50 people from across the industry that are deemed the most influential in the space. It's hard to debate that he's the number one. Um, do you think that this was the right ranking or do you think this is just like kind of typical of Coindesk because Binance may have some pull there? A little of both. Uh, CZ's top of the list. Uh, prior to the meltdown, SPF might have like given him a run for his money, but after that, you know, fall from grace, can't really put him at so much as an in, uh, influencer, if you will. Um, I think they have them ranked pretty low. <laughs> they have him, I think Doquan and uh, Alex Machinsky at like 60 something. Uh, just, you know, talk about, unfortunately, the, the fall from grace, because how can you not include them in the list? But I think there's a lot of people in this space doing some uh, things to keep moving the market forward. And obviously, uh, he's doing it. So uh, I think it's it, it makes a lot of sense that he's there. Yeah, I mean, look, as for the rest of them, it's not that they it's not that they needed to be most influential in a positive way. The list is just most influential. Yeah. So having them on the list, I think, is important. But it's not like they're on the list for a good reason. All right, let's jump ahead to our final story in the Web3 Lightning Round. It's a very quick one. The nation of Malta has officially um, started the process of removing NFTs from its crypto laws. Malta was a really early adopter of crypto legislation. They started becoming a pioneer in it. Um, and this move is currently being seen as very anticipatory of a new pathway in the EU's legislation of crypto. And the reason is, is because they believe that NFTs are outside of the scope. Do you agree with it? Or do you think that this is just a one-off? So when the US, when countries in Europe, when China make big decisions, you see a lot of countries start to follow suit. We covered something a couple of weeks ago when China basically made the statement that NFTs are property. So if China can say that this is property, then I'm sure Malta then re-looked at and said, huh, we might want to re-look at this. And I'm, I, I am sure that's potentially what happened here. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not surprised by this. And I think even EU is probably going to start to look at some, some things around the use of NFTs because they see how practically NFTs can make uh, things easier and, and provide more innovation for initiatives that they have in mind. It is weird what you just said, though, because you do have to look at the way that chips fall and like what what the order of dominoes are, right? I don't actually think that this follows China directly. I think there were a couple other moves internationally that led to Malta making this decision. But I'm curious at what point do you start to see a chip fall or a domino fall like the US or the EU or even um, um, the UK? 
because they're starting to be more progressive as well. Um, it's it, it's an interesting development to say the least. I'm going to watch it a little bit more closely, but I believe the nations like the Bahamas and the smaller players really do serve as an indicator that these changes can come and they may come quicker than you think. Look, go to go back to the top of the show. I don't think any of us thought that chat GPT would be here as fast as it as it was or like the the dawning of AI in its infancy, right? It, I never thought it would get to the public this fast at the very least. I think that NFT legislation could be something that comes quickly in 2023. And it's going to be less so about regulating it and more so about excluding it, which I'm okay with because I think that NFTs need to be treated appropriately, but that doesn't mean that they need to be lumped in with all of these other tokens that are fungible because the fungibles are the ones that could very easily be securities. It, NFTs are just not. It, it's, it's so clear that NFTs are not securities. It just, it would never hold up in, in a court of law. So they need to have unique legislation. It needs to stand apart. So I'm excited to see where it goes. I will watch it more closely. Make sure we keep you updated at home. Let's jump into last week in the metaverse though, because we got a couple of interesting NFT related stories for you before we close this out. OpenSea, you may be familiar. They've officially changed course again on royalties after creator pushback. The war that we've seen on royalties across this past year has been unreal. And more and more exchanges are taking this no royalty stance. And I think a lot of users are starting to move away from OpenSea. And OpenSea is trying to stay now in the defense of the creator. And that's a really, really big deal, especially as they continue to onboard new chains, you know, one by one. It's only a matter of time before Tezos is over here. It's only a matter of time before we start to see um, NFTs from newer chains that start coming down the line. I want to believe that they're going to make the right decision at the end of the day, but I also want to believe that all these other exchanges are going to do the right thing. And that right thing, in my opinion, is honor the royalties. Because what was part of the big appeal of NFTs in the beginning? It was royalties. royalties because yes. for the, Exactly. For the longest time, artists weren't able to take any type of secondary royalty. It was a one-time sale. This allows artists to have a sustainable income for the first time ever. And to just say no to that, it feels messed up. Um, what's your read on the situation? Are you, do you view it similarly? Greed is the word that keeps coming to my mind. When people feel like they're spending all these extra fees on trying to buy something, they try to make those fees go lower. But if they keep their margins the same, if not even make them a little bit bigger. So for example, if uh, someone puts a royalty on ABC NFT and all in, uh, I have to spend $10. But if I remove that royalty uh, and I still can, you know, keep them out that I was going to charge anyway, and maybe even add a little bit more. And now it cost you $7. I just saved you $3. You're happier, but it messes over the, the, the in person. So I think enough people got mad and enough of these creators are like, no, no, forget this. I'm going to take my business elsewhere and open see probably started seeing some market share disappear. And they're like, well, let's get back in front of this. Cause for, for this much flip flopping, it, it must've impacted pretty aggressively and pretty heavily quickly. Like, we, we, we've been covering this over like the last couple of weeks or several weeks. So, uh, yeah, it, I'm glad that they're reversing course. I think, I think these different artists should be getting their royalties. And I think this will continue to evolve over time. But I don't think this, this is a war that's going to stop anytime soon. Yeah, I want to have faith. I, I do. I, I really do want to believe that this is going to come to some kind of universal agreement, but it goes the same way that regulation does. Unfortunately, it's like you need to work through these things to get to the point where you have like group consensus. And until all these players come together and 
like agree unilaterally to like basically form a coalition on the practice, it's just going to be the war that you're saying it's going to be. So I hope that these players start to come together a little bit more and make these decisions collectively and work out what the right way is for their platforms um, and take into account what the users want, take into account what the creators want and make decisions accordingly. It shouldn't just be their call. Um, So yeah, I'm hopeful, but I'm also skeptical. Let's move into the next one. Um, This is one that like, I I feel like we just keep going. It's just day after day after day. It's another board Ape story. It's another Yuga story of a lawsuit that they're facing. And it's a good thing that they did that capital raise where they basically got, what was it? A $2 billion valuation or something. Yeah. Some huge, it was, it was, it was something crazy. And that valuation and the capital they raised, I think is going to be the only reason Yuga survives. Because to face the amount of lawsuits that they're facing right now, it would sink any other project besides Ripple. Ripple's the only other one that could really take it. So the most recent lawsuit is alleging that Yuga conspired to push Board Ape Yacht Club via celebrities, citing um, like the likes of Justin Bieber, Kevin Hart, Jimmy Fallon, and Madonna as players who promoted these NFTs to the public. And it was all as a ma- all as a means of manipulating price and increasing demand. I hate to say it this way, and I really do hate to say it this way because, like, we talk about influence, right? And we talk about how influencers are "quote unquote" bad, but celebrities, I think, are they need to be held to a different standard because, realistically, a celebrity is somebody who has earned community respect attention, a platform. Influencers influencers a lot of the time are people that have gamed a system. In this specific lawsuit, the fact that they either back funneled money through MoonPay to pay these um, celebrities to um, endorse Board API Club or not, to me feels irrelevant. (laughs) Because when a new product comes to market, right? Whether it's an iPhone or the newest Prada bag, if something's fashionable, if something's a product... Shoes, Nikes. Exactly. The, like the new crypto kicks. If people see it and they see it from people that they look up to, they're heroes, they're going to want it. It's not hard. Like it, it, it's been done with other products so many different times across history. Do you think that LeBron has an iPhone in his hand in a video for any other reason than Apple is paying him? No, not at all. And, and it's just the same thing. It's, just, it's different because it's digital. Yeah, man. I don't, I don't, they're going to have a tough time winning this. So uh, Kim Kardashian and um, Mayweather recently won their court case about, uh, Ether Max, and I think it's going to be something like this, where like they're going to have a, a hard time proving that what they did was nefarious, and that they were like doing it from pure gain for themselves. Like, I don't believe Justin Bieber went and bought a one point whatever billion million dollar board ape to try to flip it for ten million dollars, right? Like, I I don't. It, it, I feel like that's going to be something hard to try to to prove. Now, was were they paid to go and promote X Y thing X Y Z thing and to do like the promotion and all that kind of stuff, and also being owners of said thing? Going back to your point, LeBron probably has an iPhone. He definitely gets paid to go do iPhone commercials. Are people going after them because of potential? Or even if you want to talk about shoes, and you talk about like, well, who makes those shoes? And are there potential things in the process of the shoes that are pretty shady along the way? And are you now going to try to sue them for promoting that shoe? Like, it again, I think this is going to be something that's hard to to hold up in court. And again, I think I think that it just goes back to the Financial Disclosures Act because that's what they're going on the basis of right now. They're saying that. Like you need to adhere to the Financial Disclosures Act and constantly tell the public that you are at a financial benefit 
by endorsing something. And in some cases, I would agree. I think that you do need to do that. But in this case, especially that level of celebrity, it should damn near be implied that they're going to like financially benefit from this. It, it just, it, it, it is so plain to see that at some level, they're going to financially benefit, whether it's by MoonPay paying them or compensating them in board apes. Like, it's going to happen. They're going to financially benefit. I think influencers are the ones that ultimately need to be held to that standard because they operate in this weird gray area. And until they reach a certain level or we start to establish a standard for what that level looks like, it's just going to look messy and we're going to see more of these lawsuits. I don't want to go much further on this one. I think we beat it to death. Um, it just, it, it's time that we start to call it what it is. It's a product. It's what NFTs are. They're products. They're not necessarily investment vehicles. That's what the SEC wants you to believe. All right. Now that I've said my piece on it, next story, let's get this thing back on, back on the tracks. You love the World Cup. If there's any one thing I've learned from your Instagram stories across the last three weeks, it is that you are sitting on your couch watching the World Cup. Crypto.com's um, CRO token has just in this past week started surging as its World Cup NFTs in partnership with Coca-Cola have officially kicked off. As a World Cup fan, what do you think about this? Do you think that you should be out there buying World Cup NFTs? Like, what's your read? And is it that there's something beyond these NFTs being put out by Crypto.com that's got their um, their token surging? I think there's multiple facets to look at why this is really cool and a unique opportunity. So a lot of exchanges have had their own native token, and it doesn't necessarily mean that there is true utility especially outside of the world of, of trading. So uh, FTX is an example. They had their own native token. Uh, Binance has its own native token. Crypto.com has CRO. So with this, by having an NFT tied to it and being able to do things with that, they're creating more use cases, more value for owning said token. So I think that's one use case that I think is unique and, and cool to see. The next is when you think about being able to attend something like the World Cup and whether it's tickets, whether it's having a unique uh, moment in time, these are memorabilia. These are experiences that people want to be able to capture and potentially be able to share. And, and now if someone wants to potentially monetize that moment that they have because they own it and now want to give ownership to someone else who either wasn't there or was there in that moment but didn't own it and wants to now memorialize it, they can now do that. So you're now creating a new way for your audience to not just participate, but be able to potentially have some monetary gain in the process as well. So I just see this as a really cool opportunity to show use cases for more NFT opportunities like the World Cup to continue to happen into the future. And I think you're going to see this model continue to happen for various sporting events. I think that pretty much sums it up. Because honestly, like, I don't know nearly enough about the World Cup and the impact of it. I know that, of course, like everybody across the world watches it. But in a year where Croatia is upsetting Brazil and Morocco is playing France in the semifinals, it feels like a very like lesser relevant cup. Um, and I'm going to piss off a lot of people by saying that. Uh, and I don't, I, and I, 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 I don't care. It's soccer. That's that's what that's what happens. It's soccer. The U.S. had a better record than England this year. It's soccer. All right. Um, we actually have a piece of breaking news, so we're gonna play that and jump in. Playboy has announced that they will be officially celebrating their 69th anniversary nice. in the sandbox. Just came out. Um, across the wire that as Playboy has turned 69 years young, um, they will be celebrating the sandbox for 6.9 days and doing a ton with um, their 
Playboy Rabbitars, which is the uh, Avatar project they dropped, and the Playboy Party People project that they dropped. Um, they're going to have a pretty famous DJ, DJ Blondish, um, DJing multiple sets in the metaverse. You'll be able to play, um, you know, table games and like earn Playboy pro- poker chips and earn rewards by completing in-game requests up to a um, hundred thousand sand in total. Um, it's pretty interesting. This story, I like. I think that the fact that you want to see Playboy, a brand that is notoriously for adults, entering a children's game feels weird, but. Altogether, like to see a brand like them make that move into this space and really want to double down on the metaverse, um, it says a lot. So I'm I'm interested in it, but like, what do you think of this story? Because it is very very fresh. <laughs> the 69th birthday, they're celebrating for 6.9 days, and they're having their bunny avatars. This is very on brand, and I think they're trying to connect to the next audience because. Dude, how many millennials, Gen Zers, like, really even give Playboy the type of day, right? Like, I feel like it was the generation, like, the the top of millennials and generations above that, like, really understand, like, the history of it and, and you know, what they, what they stand for. Most people know what Playboy is, but, like, no one's, like, actively participating. So they're trying to connect with the next audience in what better place than the metaverse. So uh, that's, that, that's funny breaking news. I mean, look, they, they know their audience. Like they really do. I like, I get it. That it's a kid's gaming platform slash it's the first like Minecraft esque landscape in the metaverse, but they know that like people are gonna flip out on the branding of this being the 69th birthday and playing into the culture of it all. Like they're playing right into the hands of the culture, which I love. It, it shows that they're actually somewhat in touch with what's going on here. Um, so that's our breaking news for the day. We hope you enjoyed it. Let's jump into our last few stories before we call this a day. Um, Starbucks Odyssey, they dropped their official NFT program on Polygon. They made the announcement a little while ago. It's meant to be a loyalty program and it's all delivered through NFTs. And it seems to me that they've, as they've rolled out the open beta, demand for this is insanely high. And as it continues to roll out, we're going to see more pro- more um, businesses like Starbucks roll out programs just like this on Polygon. This is the case study on what it looks like to have a loyalty program that is NFT based. Now, by the time we get there next year, they're not going to be referred to at, like when you when you see the next five companies roll out programs like this, they're no longer going to be referred to as NFT loyalty programs. They're going to be referred to as digital collectible loyalty programs. It's what it's going to be. And people need to like wrap their heads around that now because terminology in 2023 is going to be a rapidly changing landscape. It's not going to be nearly as technical as it is today. But the fact that people want it right now, while it's in the current lingo, says a lot to me. It says that this is something that is not going away. NFTs are here to stay. And you need to be the ones to adapt to it because the businesses that you buy from and that you shop with, they already have. So it's like get on the bus or just like go home. What do you think of this one real quick um, before we dive into our last two? Yeah, uh, I don't have a lot to add to it other than the demands there. And I also think that they're going to be digital collectibles as well. I think a lot of things are going to be rebranded next year, especially as more and more regulation starts to enter the market after the craziness that was 2022. No doubt. All right, into our second to last story in last week in the metaverse. And this one will be quick because I don't want to talk about it for long. Um, Tim Ferriss rolled out a brand new project um, that he was very clear that he was only doing it for creating story and like trying to create a uh, NFT fiction based project. Um, That he was going to basically do this for as long as it was fun to him and then he was going to drop it flat. Um, People apparently were really okay with that. There were also people on Twitter that were really not okay with that. I got to tell you, dude, like if you're going to be upfront about a rug pull, I'm okay with it. 
like this is meant to be really funny. The the entire project itself is called Cock Punch, which says really what you're going to get down the line if you stay in this project too long, right? But it's actually meant to be a big story and the, the artwork on it looks like it's pretty legit. They're good 3D structures. Um, they, it sold out pretty much immediately and has gone on to now since do over $3.3 million in volume on secondary. What I mean, like, what do you think of it? Like the narrative behind this one is just so weird and out there that I don't know how impactful this is going to be on the overall market. So for those who don't know, Tim Ferriss is famous for a lot of things. One is the 4-Hour Workweek book. Um, he has his own podcast. Um, has a huge audience already, right? So what have we seen with a lot of people who have their own audiences? Uh, if you provide enough value to them, if you go create a thing, they're going to go buy it. And so the fact that this sold out very quickly, not surprised. Uh, the other thing that was surprising was how Fernie was about like, yep, yeah, I'm just doing this until it, it doesn't serve me. I can't get mad at that. I just can't like he's saying from the jump, like it's almost like getting into a relationship. It's like, Hey, I'm only here for X amount of time. This won't be long-term. This is just enjoy the ride. Like he's being upfront. And I, again, I can respect that. So I, I don't really have much to add on top of that. Yeah. It's going to be one of those things that like you don't, you don't want to hold on to for too long, at least in my opinion. But if you want to play the flip right now on the attention for it, I can, I can't blame you. All right, let's jump into our final story in Last Week in the Metaverse. This is one that's near and dear to my heart, um, but it just is, to me, it's much more of an indicator that despite it being a bear market, quality projects are still going to rise to the top. Metagood, which is the parent company of Onchain Monkey, has officially closed a $5 million pre-seed funding round um, that has included the likes of capital from Animoca Brands, Mark Yusko from uh, Morgan Creek Digital and the VC firm that Joe Montana has started. Now, there are like 15 other really big time names that were listed in this race. The people that this team surrounds themselves with is unlike any other project out there. And they're really based around the idea of like collective action for like social good. So to me, like this is a project that deserves the funding, has continued to show time and time again that they deliver against their promises, and ultimately is staging up for much bigger things. Um, I'm pretty damn active in the OCM community. I'm really bullish on the news. I'm curious just as like an investor, Richard, like what do you think of this news and how does it guide your investment decisions going forward? Uh, it's a good pre-seed round. Um, closing that kind of money, getting those kind of investors. Um, it shows a lot of confidence in the future of where it's headed. Um, as long as they can, can meet their timeline, I guess, of, of all the things that they have between their roadmap and when they're planning on getting a lot of those things done, if they can execute on that, it's not going to be hard for them to raise money. Um, so I, I think if anything, it just shows that what they're building is the brand that they're building is strong and that people really believe in, in the future that they have and that it can be a multiplier, right? Because I mean, the 5 million was raised at a certain valuation. So that means that when they raise probably more money, it's going to be at an even larger valuation. So you got to have a good <clears throat> feeling that if you raise this kind of money during this kind of market, uh, right things are in the future. Yeah, the final note that I would say to it is that when you look at a company that's doing a raise, a lot of the time in a pre-seed round, you're selling an idea. You're not selling like a track record, right? That's one of the things that is very different about this because it was a pre-seed raise. OCM and Metagood have like been doing a lot since September 11th of last year. But that's, when the, that's when the Genesis um, project launched. They've done a tremendous amount of volume on secondary. They have launched a secondary collection. They've partnered with a number of big time names um, for like big time act, like actions out in the community to like help others. And they're just like this. This says we're just getting started. Five million for a pre seed round, Rich. Like you, you operate a crypto hedge fund. You work, you know, with a crypto VC. Like, correct me if I'm wrong. Like that is not a typical pre-seed number. 
Uh, just depends on the project. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, for an NFT project, to me, that is a lot. That's a lot, especially in a bear market. Um, just my two cents. I think that it's something very much so worth watching. But that is going to be wrapping up our Aftershock for this week. Again, we know this was a little bit longer of an episode. We'll apologize to our editor and our producer later for having to edit a couple extra minutes. But we do want you to know at home, we appreciate everybody for tuning in and joining us. Come back next week for our 2023 predictions video and a little retrospective on the year. Um, a whole lot of really great stuff happened this year, despite all of the different black swans, um, things that I'd never thought I'd say on an episode of a podcast. Um, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of great stuff coming. I'm very, very hopeful. Um, Richard, would you like to tell the folks at home a little bit about who you spoke with on our interview from this past Monday? Yeah, so I spoke to um, Emil Duby, who is with XDeFi. Uh, they're creating a universal wallet. Um, it has a lot of utility across a lot of different ecosystems and, uh, they're trying to compete with, you know, MetaMask and a bunch of others. Um, whether you want to use it as a Chrome browser, uh, native, they, they have a lot of really cool things in the horizon, even being able to have the, a DEX where you can like go across several different, um, layer ones. So, uh, really interesting conversation. Uh, definitely go give it a listen if you're still looking for a good wallet to use. Awesome. Again, we've got two more interviews coming out before the end of the year. Please stay tuned over on our YouTube channel and our podcast. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe over on YouTube. Make sure you're following the show wherever you get your favorite podcasts so that you can get updated whenever we drop new content. But that's going to do it for us over here at CryptoCurrent. We hope that you guys have a great rest of the week. We'll see you next week for the next Aftershock. Until then, stay CryptoCurrent. Later, guys. Thank you for joining us for another episode of CryptoCurrent. CryptoCurrent is a cryptocurrency and blockchain education platform that's bridging the gap between the curious newcomers who are just discovering the space and the thought leaders who are shaping its future. All opinions expressed by Richard Carthon, the CryptoCurrent team, and their guests on this show are exclusively their own opinions. This show and any other CryptoCurrent production is exclusively for informational purposes. 